If you're going to actually place a bet on a non-sovereign store of value, the dollar is not it, the euro is not it, Bitcoin is the first thing if we just look at distribution. Price is simply what two people decide to exchange a small amount of any asset for. It has nothing to do with the value. Want to be happy? Build a life, not just a business. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know you've got something more inside you too. You have Michael Jordan level talent at something. So today, let's live your best belief life and learn what successful people think about Bitcoin. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one. Invest in dominant assets with Michael Saylor. If you pull in your time frame to less than a year, less than 12 months, and you and you consider, you know, regulatory uncertainty and market liquidity crisis, like just about anything can happen. And we just saw an example with the China exodus with a major yeah. shock, which drived a lot of a lot of people had to forcibly liquidate their holdings in China. If you look at it, it was a crackdown not just on Bitcoin mining, it's a crackdown on Bitcoin holding and the ownership of it. So you can see things like that and you can see that ripple through all the leverage and the crypto markets. That's why I think trading it and uh, speculating it are really difficult. What's the most popular monetary asset in the world? The dollar. What's the second? The euro. What's the third? The third is Bitcoin. So. So of the top three, the only one that's going to go up in value as we print more money is Bitcoin. And, and then if I want to go find another scarce asset, everything else, Apple stock, Google stock, every other crypto is less popular. So I'm looking at Bitcoin as uh, the most distributed, strongest brand of a monetary asset in the world. So if you're going to actually place a bet on a non-sovereign store of value, the dollar is not it. The euro is not it. Bitcoin is the first thing if we just look at distribution. So in that case, you just take a 10 year time horizon and you say, OK, well, Bitcoin is a is a digital property. I'll wait 10 years. And if there was one that was more successful, like how did I choose Facebook? Because Facebook was the dominant social network. How did I choose Apple? Because they had the best, most dominant iPhone. How did I choose Google? Pretty obvious, right? I didn't choose them when they were 5% of the market. I chose them when they were 40, 50, 60% in the market, but they'd only penetrated 2, 3% of where they're going to be. I think in terms of, you know, addressing the issue, is Bitcoin a monetary or an inflation hedge head on? Well, I mean, I when I'm looking at numbers, you take the 10-year view, you know, and the 10-year average, you know, growth rate of Bitcoin is 116% and gold is 1.6%. So it's pretty clear that gold is not serving as an inflation hedge in the past decade compared to Bitcoin. If I take the 10-year 10 uh, 10 numbers for the S&P, it's 12.34% right now. If I take NASDAQ, it's seven, it's 18%. Obviously, big tech is doing better than S&P. S&P is doing better than gold. Bitcoin is doing better than them all. If I look at the last 12 months, we dumped a lot of liquidity in the market. So what happens? Well, you know, gold is down 1%. The money passed gold. S&P is up 39%. Uh, people piled into the S&P index as a store of value. NASDAQ is up 44%. The long bonds are down 11%. Bitcoin's up 277%. If I'm looking at those numbers, the story it's telling me is that in an environment where you're printing a lot of liquidity, either over the near term or the long term, people are choosing big tech, then they're choosing equity, and they're, they're choosing crypto overall. Now, I focus on Bitcoin because I see Bitcoin as the risk off crypto asset, right? It's like the sovereign, if you're looking for the long bond or the sovereign debt of crypto, I mean, it is the most uh, risk off asset. Ethereum and the other, some of the other ones, they can show higher, you know, higher gains from period to period, but there, there's more risk in them. You know, it's not, it's not hating on them. It's just risk on, risk off. Rule number two, understand money with Raul Paul. What gets worse about this is this affliction, this crypto affliction we all get, right? The rabbit hole, as it's known. You start with understanding money, which most of us don't think about. 
then you kind of understand how we're getting screwed by central bank printing and the, the debt-laden economy and what it means. And then you start saying, oh, okay, but that's Bitcoin. And then what's this Ethereum business? And then you start realizing decentralized finance. And you're like, it's kind of a finance thing, but that's kind of cool because I can get yields now. You know, I can get, instead of getting zero on my bank account for my hard savings, I can now get 6% a year. Wow, that's a difference. It's like going back 25 years in time. And then suddenly NFTs come and community tokens. And suddenly your mind is completely blown that this is not just money. It's the entire exchange transfer and storage of value for the internet. Whole business models are about to change massively because of what this technology unlocks. And then once you get that, your head around that, you're like, oh God, I can't even hold this in my mind any longer. It's so big. Um, and that it's not just buy some Bitcoin, I'm going to make some money over time. You know, It's actually an entirely parallel financial system and business structure for the world. And it's being adopted faster than anything we can ever imagine. Rule number three, be smart with Robert Kiyosaki. Bitcoin is important. It's going to crash. I think if it goes to 27,000 a coin, I'm going to back up the truck. I'm going to buy more. Yeah, because I'm very optimistic about Bitcoin. And let me explain why, but also why the risk is here. This is macro financial education. In 1960 and 1980, my generation, the boomers, didn't like stocks because everybody at my time of when I was a kid, everybody said anybody invests in the stock market is a gambler. Now, everybody's in the stock market. So how did that happen? Well, in 1974, they brought this thing called a 401k out. I won't touch that thing. I would not touch a 401k or an IRA. Why? Because I don't have to. You know, they tell you exactly to tell you when to wear the mask and when to get a vaccine. They tell you what you can invest in, in a 401k and an IRA. I refuse to do that. I refuse to do that, but I don't have to do that because as an entrepreneur, I create my own assets. I don't need the stock market. You do. I'm not saying don't invest in it. I'm not saying don't have a 401k, don't have an IRA. Gold will not crash but crypto could. You know why? Because the Fed doesn't want it. Because the reason I like crypto, the reason I buy Bitcoin and Ethereum and all that stuff is I don't like the Fed. When I talk to most of the young guys, they don't like the Fed either. But the problem is, and this is why you've got to be smarter, is that the Fed wants to take this out. The European Central Bank, the ECB, wants to take it out. The Bank of Japan wants to take it out. The Bank of China wants to take it out. So that's why you crypto guys, you've got to be smarter today. You don't just sit there and go, oh. So you crypto guys, you've got to be smarter because what possibly, it hasn't happened yet, is a Fed coin or a Yuan coin, a Chinese coin. China and China will probably have it before the U.S. Mm -hmm. And there will be a European coin. And that'll destroy, the, they'll destroy, they want to destroy Bitcoin. So you guys in Bitcoin, you've got to be smarter. So as it's coming down, like I said, I'm still going to buy more. But when it passes 27,000, I'm going to back up the truck, just like I did when it passed uh, 9,000. Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's what uh, traders do. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number four, know when to buy with Kathy Wood. 
I think we're in a risk off period and uh, for, for all assets, if you if you look at the, the stock market, the, the more risky or volatile parts of the market have come in dramatically since mid February. And I think a lot of the concerns have been around inflation. Initially, that was helping Bitcoin uh, because obviously Bitcoin's a very important inflation hedge. You know, it's a it's a rules based monetary policy, the first global rules based monetary policy we have ever had hugely important reserve currency of the crypto asset ecosystem. Uh, but I think uh, what's happening right now is because the stock market, the highly volatile part of the stock market, the innovation oriented part of the stock market has gone through such a correction, which has been flamed by inflation fears. Uh, I think I think the correlations uh, among volatile assets are going to one right now, and that's including Bitcoin. Do you think we go much lower from here? Uh, you never know how low is low when a market gets very emotional. Uh, a lot of traders see Bitcoin uh, dropping below the 200-day moving average, uh, which right. is which was at 40. Uh, so traders, once that happened, they just dump. Some just uh, dump and run. Uh, I think we're in a capitulation phase. Uh, Yassine has uh, a dashboard. We were looking at all the indicators this morning. They are all suggesting that we are in the capitulation phase phase, which is a really great time to buy, uh, no matter what the asset is. A capitulation phase is buy. It's on sale. Now, am I saying 35000 is the low? You know, if traders, uh, and there are a lot of speculators in, in Bitcoin, if they are uh, running for the hills just because uh, Bitcoin has broken through a moving average that is important to them. It could continue, but uh, all of our indicators are saying this is capitulation right now. Rule number five, understand the market with Mark Yusko. Your latest 250000 for Bitcoin, but within a five-year window, which I have to say um, is not as bullish as other guests who have had, I've had on calling for that target this year alone. Yeah, look, I, you know, what's interesting is I, I say that the idea that, that any of us know what the price of, of any asset is going to be in the very short term is really kind of crazy in the sense that uh, one of the challenges we have for all assets is, is the value of something is relatively easy to determine. There are cash flow models for stocks and bonds, and, and there are uh, dividend discount models, and there are you know, other models for networks and there's Metcalf's law and all the things that people have applied uh, to come up with what the value of the asset or the value of a network will be. The hard part is the price because the price, as I, I stole a line from John Burbank, the famous hedge fund manager, price is a liar. And price is simply what two people decide to exchange a small amount of any asset for. It has nothing to do with the value. People exchange at low prices when it's below the fair value. People exchange at high prices, uh, well above fair value. And it's like a pendulum, right? It spends very little time in dead center. It's usually too far to the left or too far to the right. Same thing true with Bitcoin's price. It's rarely on the value. And so my forecast is really about the value of the network. And the value of the network comes from the users, from the transactions, from the blocks, and all the things that we can put into a model that say the value of the network right. you know, should be, according to this, then this is a model that, that I borrowed, which means stole, because Picasso said, good artists borrow, great artists steal, <laughs> that I, I stole from uh, somebody back in 2014. And uh, it basically uses Metcalf's law to draw a parabola and it's a you know nonlinear logarithmic regression, which most of us are really bad at. Uh, math is hard. And long story short, it said it'd be ten thousand dollars in value in November of 2017. Pretty good call. We hit it almost six days to the to the day. Uh, but then the price went all the way to twenty thousand, and then crashed all the way to three thousand. So the price was very different than the value. This same model says the value by July of this year will be around $100,000. And so, and out five years from now, it'll be $250,000. Now, what is possible, I won't say likely, but it's certainly possible that like in 2017 and like in 2013, the price goes much above value in the fall of this year because individuals come in. And what happens is 
all markets migrate ownership. The original owners of any asset are, are investors, right? They buy it because it's below its fair value and they want to hold it for the long term. And then as things start to move, the traders come in and the traders are looking for things that are moving in one direction or another and have a shorter duration of hold. The problem is when the speculators come in. When the speculators come in, they only buy what's moving and they really only buy what's moving up and they use leverage. And so what happens is they push the price way above fair value. And in this latest cycle in December, January, we had some gamblers show up and gamblers usually don't play in financial markets, right? They usually go to Vegas or gamble online, but because of the lockdowns with COVID, they didn't have any place else to go. So they gambled in the stock market like GameStop and AMC and they gambled in crypto. And that's why I think we got a little further away from fair value in uh, the last couple of months than we should have. And that's why we've had this kind of vicious correction here recently. And a Just speculator actually plays in markets where the expected outcome is not negative, right? Gambling is a negative net present value activity. If you go to Las Vegas right. and you gamble a lot, you will lose money because the house wins. The odds are tilted in the house's favor. And the only way you win in gambling is if you win early, you get lucky and you stop. <laughs> That's how you win. And so the same thing's true here is if, if you got a, a stimulus check from the government and you had no knowledge of cryptocurrencies other than, hey, that price is going up, that's a gamble that you can buy it and then sell it at a higher price to some greater fool and get your money back. However, if you're foreign to that market, which I love your word, use of the word foreign, because that's what it is. If you're foreign to that market, you might not know what the triggers are or what happens when a bunch of highly levered speculators, right, again, who do this for a living, start to get liquidated in China. And we see prices fall, you know, thousand point candles or, you know, 3000 point right. candles. That is a very different environment. And the average, I, I tweeted about this a while ago. Look, if you bought something because the price was moving up and the price starts going down, you will sell it, right? Because you have no conviction, you have no courage, you did no work. It doesn't make you a bad person. It just acknowledge it for what it is. It's speculation or gambling. If you're an investor, and the price of an asset falls to a level that you believe is below the fair value, right. not only will you not sell, you'll buy more. Rule number six, go safer with Alex Mashinsky. You have to understand that uh, let's say tomorrow morning, somebody hacks uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum because they have uh, the world's uh, strongest computer and nothing happens to the history of blockchain. It's just that going forward, we have to fork the chain and make it quantum resistant and uh, today, the most sophisticated computers are running uh, probably 400 qubits. That's like the latest and greatest stuff that's uh, still in testing in labs. Uh, and you need thousands of these uh, qubits to be able to uh, even uh, try to attempt to uh, break the hash 256 uh, encryption. Um, I think that, uh, you know, we are years away from that happening, and uh, uh, almost every chain has the time to effectively become quantum resistant. Also, yeah. these chains are, are the young chains have a much higher uh, uh, risk of being hacked because they're not as resistant, right? Because on, on Bitcoin, you have to hack or you have to break. 12 years worth of blocks, right? The, where on a new chain, you might have to break only one year worth of blocks. So the Bitcoin is definitely a thousand times more secure and more safe than anything that comes after it. And maybe the second safest network would be Ethereum, but Bitcoin is a thousand times more safe because it's a logarithmic scale. It's not a linear scale. Uh, with the need, how much computation you need to break the chain. So I don't see any of that happening in the next five to 10 years. And rule number seven, the last one before some very special bonus clips is target millions with Robert Breedlove. Bitcoin itself 
is not a network that is going to conform to any jurisdictional law whatsoever. And that's what makes it so important, frankly, is that it's the one monetary network we've ever had in history that does not respond to coercion or force. So try as they might, um, I'm sure you know the US government in all its wisdom will gradually adapt to the Bitcoin network, find a way to um, monitor and tax the transactions as best that they can. But in the long run, uh, as we can get more deeply into, I see Bitcoin as fundamentally disruptive to gold uh, and government and central banking itself is an apparatus built on top of gold. So I do think that this, this wave of innovation is massive and it's something that uh, it's very difficult for us to even comprehend in our worldviews its, its long-term repercussions. Because mm. you told Robert Kiyosaki about a month ago that in 10 years time, in 2031, you see Bitcoin at $12.5 million, but with an inflation-adjusted value of around $1 million, meaning the current purchasing power of $1 million per Bitcoin. Do you maintain that outlook? I do maintain that outlook. Um, and this is based on percentage expansion rates of money supplies historically. So the United States expanded into over 30% last year. And it's easy to forget, and mankind has forgotten this repeatedly throughout history, it usually takes a few generations each time, that the expansion of the money supply is governed by a law. It's called the law of accelerating issuance and depreciation. So the more money you print, the more money you ultimately later have to print just to keep the system uh, going. So I do expect the expansion of USM2 to, to double again, probably in the next four years. And then I expect it to double again from there. So we'll be north of 100% US M2 expansion annually by the end of the decade. Um, and the same time, because money has this centri uh, centripetal network effect, we tend towards one. That's what gold was. That's what the US dollar is. I do expect a lot of the weaker international currencies to collapse into the dollar during this transition. So I'll, I would say that um, global... Uh, M2 today is about $100 trillion. USM2 is about $20 trillion, So it's roughly 20% of that. I would expect USM2 to expand to be about 40% of global M2 by the end of the decade. But global M2 itself will have expanded from $100 trillion due to this law of accelerating uh, issuance and depreciation to about $1.25 quadrillion, which is $1,250 trillion. Um, and in that time as well, I expect Bitcoin as essentially the ultimate irrepressible non-counterparty insurance policy against central banks to appreciate in tandem. So I think its purchasing power will increase to a, to a million dollars in 2021 dollar purchasing power. But by that time, due to the expansion in the money supply from 100 trillion US M2 to 1250 uh, trillion M2, Bitcoin will actually be nominally valued at $12.5 million US by the end of the decade. Further, at that point, uh, currencies tend to start hyperinflating. So I actually think fiat currency globally will be collapsed by the mid 2030s. But what makes you so confident still that Bitcoin is going to be the solution here? Bitcoin has introduced properties of money that are as close to perfect as the world has ever had. And so what I really challenge people that are skeptical of Bitcoin to do is to ask themselves, first of all, the question, what is money? And then secondly, why was gold selected by the free market as money? Why has gold stood the test of time for over 5,000 years? Um, what are the properties of gold that caused it to be selected? And if you do that digging, you do that homework, you're going to end up very deep into Austrian economics at some point, which is the cumulative wisdom of humanity on economics. Um, and it stands in counter distinction to Keynesian economics, which I would classify more as central bank propaganda. And gold and money in general is essentially selected based on five properties. Uh, I've covered this a lot in my work. Uh, they are divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, scarcity. I won't expound upon them here, but you know, feel free to dig some into Austrian economics or check out my work to see why. Um, and essentially across those five properties of money, Bitcoin has perfected them in a way that the world's never seen before.
Now I've got a special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, it's time for the good deed of the day. This is something new. I believe that you're built to serve and it feels so good to do something nice for somebody else. So good deed of the day, put down in the comments one thing that you need help with, that you're working on, that you'd love some support or guidance on, and then two, go comment on somebody else's comment and give them some love, give them some support, give them some encouragement, maybe give them some connections, try to help them solve that problem. Even if it's saying, I believe in you, that one little bit of encouragement can be the difference between somebody quitting and continuing on. So the good deed of the day in the comments below, write down one thing that you need help on that you're struggling with, that you're working on. And then part two is go give love to somebody else in the comments too, and let them know that you believe in them as well. The way you have to think about this, there's a lot of excitement within the crypto community, particularly around Bitcoin, that it's to the moon. You've heard that expression many times and that it won't be long before it's $100,000 a coin. None of that's going to happen unless the institutional market starts to buy this as an asset class. And for all the hype and excitement and all the you know, discussions that have been going on online and on social media, the truth is institutions haven't touched this yet. Not the real institutions, not the sovereign funds, not the pension plans, very, very few are involved in it. And one of the major reasons, if not the reason, is that they all now have to be compliant to sustainability and ethics committees. And the way you have to look at that is, you know, you've got, let's say you're managing $50 billion, you're, you're, you're a, a sovereign fund, and, and you are concerned about the long-term investment. That's the nature of what they do. And so you concern yourselves about the, the issues that, that the people that you're serving care about. And one of those that has been coming and moving right up the hit parade is sustainability, ESG. Uh, you've seen it happen at the corporate level. There's a very famous letter that came out of Larry Fink at BlackRock just six months ago that really defined what it meant uh, to be sustainable and climate change and all of these things that people kind of ignored for a long time. But now at the institutional level, if you're sitting with a sustainability committee on top of the investment committee, you have to go through their filter first. And their filter has been very clouded by this debate around sustainability and coin mining. You know, there's many miners, particularly in Asia and other foreign countries that actually burn coal to make Bitcoin. Well, that's not okay anymore. And that's why this debate has come to the fore. But, but I see it's important and it's a good thing because if we can resolve this, we can open up the floodgate, the log jam, if you would, of institutional money that wants to allocate to Bitcoin. So I, as a Bitcoin owner, want the institutional buyer to be my incremental buyer. That way I can see price appreciation. We're gonna be stuck in a rut here till we resolve this issue. And I think it's very important to have an open forum about it and have a dialogue. I took a lot of criticism when I raised this just a couple of months ago. Now it's at the fore of everybody's discussions. Because the industry has no voice, it has no lobby, it has no way to fight back when a single regulator, a single state or a municipality basically bans Bitcoin or tries to keep capital away by threatening something like this, there's nowhere to go. All you have is a barrashment of, of social media occurring, but no centralized voice or committee. So I applaud anything that tries to aggregate the thought process. And this, there's many different forms being proposed. And in fact, there's a really big, bit, a really big Bitcoin conference here in Miami on June 4th and 5th. And this will be one of the topics that's discussed because the world is gathering here in Miami and we didn't know what the core issue would be, but certainly this is going to be one of the big ones. Sustainability, ESG, institutional buying is all part of it. And I think the pressure that Elon must have felt when he announced that he would take payment in Bitcoin, well, a lot of institutions that are his shareholders in Tesla that have provided him billions of dollars of market capitalization immediately jumped on him and said, I'm speculating when I say this, but I'm sure it happened. Wait a second, where did that coin come from? How was it mined? How do you know it wasn't mined? you know, in an insustainable in, in manner or, or one that wasn't sustainable at all. And I think that's the pressure that he felt to come out and say, wait a second, I have to rethink this and I want to talk to miners. Remember, there's only two and a half million coins left to be mined. That's it. And so it depends on what happens to the next two and a half million versus all the coins that are out there already. And that's the dialogue the industry is having right now. But this issue is not going away. It is not going away. And if we want to see price appreciation, whether it be on a green coin or a sustainable coin or the aggregate of already mined coins, we're going to need to solve for this because the incremental buyer, the institution, is where the next trillion dollars worth of interest is going to come from.
If you want to know what Warren Buffett, Elon Musk, Mark Cuban, and others think of Bitcoin, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. If you're a true adventurer and you really want to throw the Hail Mary, you might take 10% and put it in Bitcoin or Ethereum. But if you do that, you've got to pretend you've already lost your money.